Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. This is the reading of the word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. The word of the Lord. We are starting a new series today called God's Revealed Wisdom. And let me just say a little word of intro to this series. It's going to be a relatively short series, five, five messages. And it's a topical series, and it has a rather practical purpose. This fall, we're going to have a, uh, our, our, new, our next season of adult education. And one of the things that we as your pastors and elders have kind of just perceived as just common uh, among American, in, in American Christianity is that a lot of people grow up, then they go to church. They're like, church, of course, church is important. And then they think, okay, I got the sermon, so I got some of God's word. And then they're like, good, checkbox, I've been fed. And... Um, and have you realized if that do you think that that is like a, an adequate way to receive enough of God's word and for you to grow and really know how to walk in Christ and live inside of his joy and his love and his grace and his truth? And if you were honest, I think you would probably say a sermon's probably not enough. <laughs> I don't think it is. And um, anyway, as as uh, young and I, we've been pastors a long time. Let me just tell you, it's not enough. For some reason, people grew up in church, and when you were a kid, you had Sunday school, okay? Um, I, I don't know, not all Christian traditions think of it this way. Like, uh, I know, like, for instance, the Baptists have Sunday school, and for them, Sunday school is also includes 60-year-olds and 50-year-olds and 20-year-olds, right? They, they don't think Sunday school stops after you're, let's say, 17 years old. But, like, I grew up in a Presbyterian setting. For some reason, Sunday school is something that happens when you are like you have church and you have Sunday school and you learn Bible and you learn theology and truths about God when you are young and you're a teenager, but somehow it kind of becomes optional when you become an adult. Well, one of the things that we 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 believe is it's not it shouldn't be optional. You shouldn't think that way. If as an adult, there are many things in life you know that you don't know. You're like you go like, wait a second, I don't really know how to do these taxes. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Like, I don't really know how to like take care of something about this car thing. All right. There's a lot of things you need to learn and to be equipped just to be a good, functional, and wise contributing adult in American society. Well, you know, there's a lot of things that you need in order to walk as a citizen of the kingdom of God, <laughs> to obey Jesus, and to walk wisely and faithfully and joyfully in this very broken and lost and corrupt culture. And so, you know, like education in the Bible and training in biblical theology and the application of biblical theology into life, which we would, uh, the Bible would uh, overall call wisdom, it often seems to be something for some reason a lot of Christians don't make that a priority in their time in their life. So this series is intended to help you build conviction to want that. Does that make sense? <laughs> we, we don't want to just go, hey, you should come to this class because we're offering you this class <laughs> and it'll help you. And you're like, yeah, it'll kind of help you, but you know what, I'm busy. Okay? We know you're busy. We know there's a lot of things pulling for your time and for your attention. But what we want is we want the Holy Spirit through the preaching of God's word and by grace to motivate you to make that a priority into your life. And if you build in certain places, you're like, you know, I didn't really know how to do this. I don't really know how to grow in certain kinds of ways. But you take some time, not when you're 14 or 15, but now that you're 25 or 35 or 55, however old you are, to really let God's word come in and become applied into your life habitually in a new way, we believe it will tremendously bless you. So that's what this series is for. It's actually quite, I'm not, when I'm not that clever. We didn't do it. It didn't plan it this way. But like we have this town hall meeting today. 
This town hall meeting is to ask you, some, some of you said, we need help in like doing parenting. I don't really know how to do this dating stuff. We've, you, we've heard you ask these kinds of questions. And so you're asking for help. You're asking for leading and guidance and teaching on this. But we, we decided instead of just kind of shooting a dart and said, this will work. We wanted to have a deep discussion about that. So then we could feed you in a way that you really feel that you need. Okay? So anyway, that's what this series is all about. Super relevant even to this um, town hall that's going to happen right after the service. So with that said, let's get out of the intro. Let's get going, all right? So part one, not wise in your own eyes. That's the way we want to become. We want to think that you are not wise. I know that's a strange goal. <laughs> in your own eyes, you want to start seeing yourself as not wise. That's a strange goal, but that's actually what the Bible says. Part two, what are your sources for wisdom? Which ones do you depend on? We all have to have some kind of wisdom source. Where do we, like, this is what makes sense. This is how things should happen. What are your sources? And part three, healing and refreshment from the foolishness of God. So let's go to part one. Let's go right into the passage. And if you grew up in the church, I hope you know this passage is a very, very justly famous set of verses. When I was a teenager, uh, I was taught to memorize this. And uh, amazingly, I never forgot it, at least verses five and six. And it goes like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your straight your paths. Isn't that pretty great? You live this life here. It's a really confusing time. American culture is just kind of cracking apart. What used to be considered right and good is changing fast. We're not even sure what is the straight path. And I'm not even talking about in church. I'm just talking about your company, your college, just in the culture, certainly in our politics, it feels very crooked, not straight, right? And so, but here's this passage. I learned as a kid, I just cannot believe how tremendously valuable it is. Conceptually, it is not hard to understand. Trust in the Lord, that's so L-O-R-D, capital L-O-R, that's trust in Yahweh, that's his name, with all your heart. That's the first thing I want to say. Now, if you are honest with yourself, do you trust in Yahweh with all your heart? <laughs> all your heart. So let's, let's, um, let's place, there's a place in my heart where my finances operate. How much money is my bank account? And how much do I need to have in there? And how much do I need for the future? And how much do I need to like spend on X, Y, and Z? Right? Let me tell you that part of my heart to give that trust to the Lord, it was hard. <laughs> and I'm a professional Christian. I actually would say, since I'm a pastor, it felt even harder because pastors don't tend to make a lot of money. <laughs> it says in the Bible, you should not covet your neighbor. Well, I used to covet my neighbor's income all the time, and I was a pastor. And I was like, if I wasn't a pastor, I would make a lot more money. And I went to the kind of school where I could have like maybe done what that guy did. Okay, so trust in the Lord with all your heart. So the place in my heart where the finances were, I didn't know how to do that. For a long time, I wrestled with that. That was very, that was not an easy thing. So just pick one place. So there's so many different places in your heart. How about another one? Trust in the Lord with your children's future. Parents, can you trust in the Lord? with your children's future? Or do they have to get into the right preschool? <laughs> then they have to get the right high school. They have to get the right college, and then the right major, and then the right spouse, which, of course, you're going to choose. <laughs> right? Because, you know, that's certainly the way I grew up. I mean, like, if I wanted to date that gal, I knew my parents would be like, no, because we've already decided <laughs> the kind of wife you're going to have. And, uh, there, there's a place where so many parents don't know how to trust and place their heart before the Lord. 
So first, let me just challenge you. The calling is hard, but it's not hard to understand, is it? It's actually quite, even a child can understand this, but you start to try to start to apply it. Now, here's what we're talking about. Here's this God's, re, this is revealed. Nobody invented this. You can't go to like college and somebody would invent this. This is not secular worldly wisdom. It's from the Bible. It's revealed by God. And what's revealed by God is it's kind of crazy. With all your heart. And then if that wasn't hard enough, let's go to the next line. And do not lean on your own understanding. Now let me just teach you a little something about how Hebrew poetry works. Not every single time, but common. And this is certainly the case here. Hebrew poetry will say something, and then it'll say something again, and the thing it says next is really just repetition. <laughs> it's synonymous. The first line says something, and then the second line is basically just saying the same thing, but it's saying it somewhat differently so that line A helps you see line B, and line B helps you see line A. Does that make sense? So really, trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding. It's not really two teachings. It's actually one teaching. <laughs> but it's two aspects. So trust the Lord with all your heart. What the Bible's saying is this is what it looks like. You want to know what it looks like? You're like, okay, okay I get it. Okay, trust the Lord. Okay, I get it. I can memorize that verse. I know what it means. But then, do you really, really know what it means? Do not lean on your own understanding. That's what it looks like. <laughs> That's strange. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, you are suspicious of your own understanding. You're very skeptical of your own understanding. You test your own understanding. You look at that understanding and go, is that the same as God's understanding? Is that what the Bible says? If that's what the Bible says, then that means that will become my understanding which is really just the Lord's understanding, now I'm trusting him with all my heart. You, are you following me? That's what it looks like. So this is really hard. <laughs> In America, you're supposed to be a free individual. And as a free individual, you get to make choices for yourself. So you know who you're supposed to trust? You. In America, we expect that you're supposed to trust in your own understanding for everything. What kind of... What kind of pants do you want to buy? Uh, I want to buy these Neo Spandex, whatever, super new, whatever. It's better. Oh, when are you supposed to buy it? Well, I'm going to buy it during Black Friday. <laughs> okay, <whatever. laughs> that's what I'm going to. You're supposed to like have some understanding of like everything in your life. But here's the Bible saying this thing, which is utterly countercultural and completely, almost insane to the American normal American way, which is be suspicious of your understanding. Do not lean on it. And let me say something else. You're like, well, we'll just try something different. You know, there is no, you have to lean on something. <laughs> you walk out into the world, you have to have some understanding of how to do it. How are you going to get into your car? Are you going to go like this? You're going to pull out this thing and put it in this little hole and go tuk, tuk, tuk? That's one way. I'm so old that I remember when that's how you have to get into the car. That was the understanding of how to get into the car. Okay, some of you, like, just have your phone and just walk up there and just look. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. So you have a different understanding than I never had. Okay? But you have to have some understanding from somewhere and you lean on it. And you know if you lean on it because you do it. So what are we talking about? We're not just talking about knowledge from the Bible that sits in your head. <laughs> we are talking about something you lean on and you will use it in your life. That's the kind of thing we're interested in. In our church, we want you to learn theology. But you know, even better than learning theology, we want you to lean into that theology and use that theology. <laughs> and if you do, in all your ways acknowledge him, then your path will become straight. That's the promise of the Bible. Not crooked, but straight. Let's go to the next verse. If that wasn't hard enough, here we go. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So let's apply what I just taught you. The first line and the second line are just basically saying the same thing. Do not be wise in your own eyes. That's how you will fear the Lord. 
Actually, we don't like that phraseology. Fear is like fear, fear. Am I, I'm supposed to be afraid of God? It's actually a very old construction. Fear of the Lord means both, yeah, you're kind of afraid of him. <laughs> and it also means you are in awe of him. Okay? You're kind of afraid of him, and you're in awe of him. It's like what my son was when he was like four years old with me. <laughs> I'd walk home, and he was like, that's my dad. And if my dad gets upset, uh-oh, <laughs> that's, that's not going to happen. I don't want that to happen. So you're kind of afraid of your dad. But he was kind of in awe of me, and he wanted to be like me. He wanted to know what I knew. He wanted to do things the way I did. I just, there's this hilarious picture that we have in our, in our house where when my son was two years old, he took, put on my socks, and it came up all the way up to here. Brook! He walked around, and he looked so happy because he could wear my socks. So it's all of that it's in there. You're kind of afraid of your dad, but you want to be like your dad. You want the great things of your dad. That's what fear the Lord means, to be in awe of him. And it says, and turn away from evil. So... So here's what this means. If you think you are wise in your own eyes, it is telling you you're evil. <laughs> That's what the passage is telling you. <laughs> you think you're wise in your own eyes, you're evil. That's what the pastor is telling you. <laughs> um, one of the great, great Bible readers of all time is Augustine. And Augustine has one of the most profound understandings of sin. And he said that when Adam and Eve chose sin as opposed to obedience to God, they wanted to be like God and replace Him. <laughs> and they wanted to be wise in their own eyes and get rid of Him. They liked the pride of getting rid of God and being wise in their own eyes. He says that's why they chose the forbidden fruit. <laughs> when I first read that, I was like, that's unbelievable. That's an unbelievably, like, supremely insightful piece of the underlying psychology and motivation of sin. And ever since then, I realized, oh my goodness, I'm so prideful, like I can't not sin. <laughs> I'm going to go to hell. Because I'm just like that. I want to be wise in my own eyes. I want to be the boss of my own life. I always want to be right for me. And it says, Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. How do you do that? What does that look like? You will not be wise in your own eyes. You will be humble, not prideful. Okay? So all of that is pretty wild and hard and honestly quite impossible. <laughs> quite impossible. Just try it. I dare you. Monday, try to do this. <laughs> Wake up tomorrow and go, let's try it. Try not to be wise in my own eyes and just run everything, okay? In my own understanding, because, you know, I'm right. Because, hey, guys, if you, have, you don't know me very well, I'm a rather opinionated person. There's things that are like, you know are right, because the Bible says this is true and right, okay? That just is, okay? And then there's a bunch of opinions. Opinions are not, you know, if they're opinions. You can have different opinions. Well, let me tell you, I think most of my opinions are right. And if you think, and if you don't, if you have a different opinion of mine, I won't say it out loud because I'm kind of smart enough to not say it out loud. But I'm like, but that's wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay. So and this has not been easy for me. It has been a lifelong repentance to let the Lord to trust me with all my heart. And you know, in order to do this, you need to learn. There's a lot of things that you trust in your life based on you, based on your understanding, based on your wisdom and your pride. And for lots of reasons that are probably not very godly. And you do it unthinkingly, habitually, and you've done it a long time. And it's very helpful to get some theological education, to dig into the Bible, and not just get like, okay, that's the right answer. I can check that box off on a test but to apply it to your life. And then listen to how some other people, 
to apply it to their life and you can grow. And various different buckets, there's so many different buckets in American culture today where the Christians don't really even know what the Bible says. So, at least if you know what it says in marriage or parenting or money, you at least have, have a chance of maybe possibly obeying it because you at least know what it says. Okay? But so many times we don't even know what's there. So we invite you to want to go know what's there and then want to want to go trust in Him with all your heart. Okay? Let's go to part two. What are your sources for wisdom? So I want you to think about this. And um, I want you to think about where you like to go. And this is just a way to like help you think this out and then find that there's a lot of buckets for you to be suspicious of. <laughs> it's a lot. So let's try, I'll try to do this quickly here. So the first one, okay, there's a lot of East Asians in this room. You like your education. You like having getting your A's or at least your B's. And if you got low in their B, that was bad, right? So you like your education. Um, there's so many people I've met who learned something in college. And then now they're 45 years old. And they're sure that that thing that they learned when they were 19 or 20 or 21 in college is right. And you know what? The science has changed, or the sociology has changed, or the context has changed. And whatever that they learn from their really, really smart professor when they're 21 years old is wrong. <laughs> so this thing that you think is so right because you were educated in it could be totally wrong. <laughs> it's happening all the time. It's actually happening a lot. <laughs> um, there's a sister who's a member of our church. She grew up in a Christian household. And then she went off to college. She came home after freshman year and told her parents, you brainwashed me with all this Jesus stuff. It was supremely painful to her parents and to her family. And she ran away from Jesus. She had come back after she had, she made a mess of her life in her 20s and came back to Jesus. And so she shared this story with me. And so I said, so you told your parents that you got brainwashed by them about this Jesus stuff? And I said, so really what happened is you went to college and they brainwashed you <laughs> about Jesus. And now you're being unbrainwashed. She said, she started laughing and she said, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> so. I'm not anti-education. <laughs> I'm huge on education. You know, like, I taught my kids to read when they were three years old because I want them to get educated. So all my kids don't ever remember a time when they couldn't read because, like, I asked my, do you ever remember learning to read? He's like, nope. I was like, good. So I wanted learning to be, like, breathing. <laughs> okay? But... I also want them to understand the stuff that's called education. You better sift it to the Bible. So when it agrees with the Bible, you're like, yes. So sometimes people think it's strange when I cite some kind of atheist and they're like, this is so good. And people are like, you know what that guy believes? You're like, yeah, all these other things he believes is totally wrong. But this piece thing that he wrote, this essay or this book, is right on. You know, it agrees with the Bible. So I actually am perfectly fine. It's great to see that other people can learn God's wisdom even they don't or even hate God. But you can't know that unless you're willing to go and learn. You can't have like God's wisdom to sift the education if you don't have this bucket. You see what I'm saying? And if you stopped when you were 17, you might want to start again, okay? Let's go to the next one. Let's go a little faster. Media or social media? Okay? Um, I'm not a Donald Trump fan, but he called our news fake news. And when I heard him say that, I was like, that's true. <laughs> it's true. Social media is even worse. There is no journalist <laughs> who vetted what's in your social media. <laughs> if it's said on YouTube, 
You can't just believe it. If it's done on TikTok, it may be propaganda from the Chinese government. Okay? I would even say it may be propaganda from the devil. So, anyway, in our house, I'm not a fan of social media. And I'm very... So if you think, I just told you to sift your education, you really, really need to sift your media. <laughs> you really, really need to sift your media. So I'm regularly going like, that was a good article. Then I read the next article from the same source. I like this magazine. That was good. Then I read this one. I was like, that was wrong. <laughs> but over time, I've been able to do that because I've allowed God's word to wash over my mind and heart and build a really biblical worldview. Now, as your pastor, I can't teach you what I don't know, okay? So, but it didn't happen overnight, okay? And you don't have to be a pastor to build this yourself, okay? What's the third one? How about your experience? So many people today, I did this, I had this job, you know, like I had this experience, and that was such a seminal and great experience. Then now, whatever wisdom you got out of experience, you just think, that's it. It's almost like gospel truth for you. How you handle your money. How you like, oh, okay, if you just do this, then you'll get a really good job because I had that experience, right? Well, no experience is 100% foolproof. And the context changes. Things change in the economy. Things change in people's psychology. Literally, the thing that worked for X generation doesn't work for millennials. So I had this experience. Sometimes I, I like offer, like, this is the way I grew. This was the experience I had that gave me some wisdom. I share it to the millennials, and they think, well, that's dumb. And I was like, well, that was not fun. I was like, I was like oh, you're dumb. You don't know what I'm I was like, I, I'm experienced. What do you know? Right? And, and I, it's just then we're just arguing my experience versus your experience. Is X-Gen right, or is are the millennials right? Well, sometimes the X-Gen are right, and sometimes the millennials are right. As an ex-gen, I tend to think we write more often. <laughs> okay? But maybe that's just wrong, too. <laughs> okay? Clearly, when it comes to technology, I just feel like an idiot around these millennials. <laughs> they go, Tiffany goes, hey, you could do this, Pastor. Watch this. And I just go, dude, I have never had that experience. <laughs> so I just get really humble when it comes to technology around you younger guys. Because I don't have that bucket of experience. But... You know, experience, be skeptical. People's experiences are changing. Sometimes people have good reasons. Let's use just a fast example. My parents grew up during the war. They were savers. They thought, how will you be safe in the world? You save, 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 save. My parents are in their 80s. There's more food in their house than necessary or five human beings to live for six months. So their experience growing up during the Korean War, did it produce wisdom? Yes. But I think it's a little dated now, don't you think? <laughs> I think. It's like, maybe we can get rid of two-thirds of this food, Mom? <laughs> right? Just as an example, so every generation goes through things, and it changes. How about this next one? Experts and expertise. Let me um, let me uh, actually critique the Christian version of this. Some people get their favorite pastor, and he's your expert. I don't think too many of you think that I'm that guy. Okay, <laughs> I don't think so. But if I am, let me criticize you for choosing Susan to be your expert. Okay. Because maybe you should trust in the Lord with all your heart and know the Bible. Now, if Susan comes up here, says something, agree, you're like, that agrees with the Bible. Yes, I love my pastor. Great. Okay? But what if I come up here and say something that's just my opinion? <laughs> and you don't like it. It's not of the Bible. And by the way, just like I said before, experts are wrong. They're right today, wrong tomorrow. <laughs> So America loves our experts. The Bible calls them the wise men. That's the biblical language for experts. We call them experts. The Bible calls them wise men. Okay? The Bible does not have good things to say about the wise men. The Bible bags on the world's wise men. 
let's pick up that spirit too. How about culture? So, culture is such a thick thing. You just grew up in your Mexican culture or your Filipino culture or, like, for me, Korean culture, and you just did these things, and it worked for you. Well, it worked for Koreans, okay? <laughs> but guess what? You're going to find out some of that stuff doesn't work in America. <laughs> and sometimes, so sometimes people, we get really, like, insistent upon these things. It's not said in the Bible. You meet somebody and bow to them. It didn't say that in the Bible. My dad used to judge me if I didn't have certain behaviors because that wasn't honorable in Korean culture. But I was like, Dad, we don't live in Korea. We live in America. And then sometimes the culture is your family culture. This is a very common thing in marriage. Your family always took vacations a certain way. Your family resolved conflicts in a certain way. This is classic. Husband, their family, conflict. They just, they fight, they scream, they yell, curse each other out. That's how they resolve things in their family. The wife, they're nice, they avoid, they, they tiptoe around their conflict avoidance. Then they get married to each other. They take their family's culture and impose it in the marriage, and man, are there problems. Instead, how about let the Lord be the Lord, Sometimes you need the conflict. Sometimes, let's put this off till tomorrow or maybe next week. See? So, don't just trust the culture. And I would especially say, be very skeptical of American culture right now. It's going in a bad direction. Okay? Okay, let's quickly wrap up. Traditions and habits. So, again, family traditions. You did things a certain way. American traditions, your work traditions, be skeptical, sift them. And lastly, family values. So your family just always valued things this way. We, we just, we love doing game night. Game night was our thing, okay? But it doesn't have to be the thing in your marriage, for instance. It doesn't have to be the thing in something else. So. You show up, in our family, we like always went to church a certain way, we dressed a certain way, we got to go to a certain kind of church this kind of way. But maybe that was just your family culture and values. So don't legalize, make like it's a law, things that are not in the law. In fact, that's so much about wisdom. We have to choose how we're going to apply things and even habitually apply things, but can you ever change them? Can you ever adjust them? Because maybe this is more in keeping with how to walk more and more toward Jesus, especially in this time and place. So, um, let's go back to this verse. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. And I want to cite this issue. So you still have all these things. You go like, look at my education, my family did things this way, this is the way my culture did things, and I'm going to sift out these things, and then you're going to like maybe date somebody, she came from a different culture, <laughs> a different part of the country, you're coming from an engineering background, she's coming from an art background, like different wisdoms, different habits, different temperaments, and then you're going to just start trying to, you're going to sift these things. Well, you still have to select out of all these different buckets. And I want to ask you, who's making those selections? Who's got the wisdom to even make those selections? And so it says, fear Yahweh. And you know what we tend to do? We're mostly, let's be in awe of myself. We replace Yahweh with me. I'm the one who's going to make all those decisions. So we're functionally so you may be a Christian, you call Jesus Lord, but really the one running your life is you. <laughs> the one who's got to make the parenting work out really well is you. The one who's going to solve this big problem that you have where you, know, you and your sister haven't been talking for the last year is you. <laughs> you probably are absolutely certain that was right. So you're going to save this relationship. You're going to be the Lord of your finances. So in your wisdom, you are self-lord, 
self-salvation. When the Lord commands us, commands us to trust in Him with all our hearts, it's not because He's a control freak. It's not because He's a killjoy. It's because He loves you. He wants to give you all good things, and even more than you could possibly imagine. So if you are running your life's wisdom on you all the time, you are running self-salvation, self-lordship. You could call Jesus your Lord, but really, on Monday, you are your own Lord. So I know that's a tough thing to say, but that's the truth. And if you are being your own Lord, your own Savior, you have a really, really, really bad Lord running your life. Don't you want a good Lord running your life? <laughs> so, let's close with the gospel. Let's take to the last verse, which I really wanted to include because it's so wonderful. Verse 8. So if you will not be wise in your own eyes, and you'll actually fear Yahweh and turn away from evil, which is like pride and you running all things, it will be healing. It will heal you. Are you a worrying person? Are you a fearful person? It will heal you. Sometimes your worries and your fears, it comes out in anger. Your kid didn't just do that quite right. I taught my kids to drive. <laughs> so scared. <laughs> I wasn't scared they would crash the car today. You know what I was scared of? That they wouldn't learn how to drive properly today so they might kill somebody tomorrow. That's what I was scared of. I was so scared of that. It just came out as anger. <laughs> I, just, I was just like pouring out anger on my kid and making the whole experience terrible. <laughs> That's what it was like. And I was like, oh wait, isn't their lives in Jesus' hand? <laughs> Aren't they smart kids who are going to learn how to drive? And it's just like me. It's not like I was a good driver when I got my license. I had to crash a few times. I had to get some tickets. I just had to do some dumb stuff. Like, but I'm afraid. I don't want that to happen to them. Like, I'm going to. I'm not generally a helicopter dad, but on the driving, I, I just became super helicopter dad. And it came out with a lot of anger because it's still fear. I need a healing. You know, refreshment to your bones. The bones are something inside of you that you cannot see. And if your bones are hurting, if your bones are like weak, it will it'll, it'll just drive your whole body crazy. Even if just one of your bones is broken or bruised, it'll make you miserable. <laughs> So here's a promise. It'll bring refreshment to the inside of you that's driving you crazy. I want to close with one of the most important passages. It's like a life passage for my life. It's one of my favorite places where the gospel is presented. And this passage shapes a lot of our church. It's deep in my convictions. It's deep in Young's convictions. We care about this passage so much. We want you to get this. We want you to memorize this passage and love it. Okay? So here's the way we'll close today's message. Oop, looks like we got a little glitch. So I guess you have to just hear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 goes like this. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. The word of the cross, there's another word for the word of the cross. That's the gospel. <laughs> Where the cross is described and explained its power, its relevance, that's the gospel. For the gospel is folly to those who are perishing. It's dumb. <laughs> In this city, you guys all know that the stuff that we believe at the center of our faith this thing about, you know, this person, Jesus, this almighty God, keeping him a human being, 
this weird thing that it's like hard to explain, Lamb of God, atonement through his actual blood, his blood like got shed, somehow it like pays for our sin. Do you like explaining that to your non-Christian friends? They probably go, what crack are you smoking, dude? That's, that's what you believe? <laughs> that sounds pretty stupid to me. We know this gospel thing sounds dumb. For the word is, of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Many of you love that the gospel gave you eternal assurance of salvation. I hope you have that. But don't you want power when you're run by your creaky bones of your soul that's filling you with fear and anger? Don't you want power that you don't have? The power of God. Well, it comes from the word of the cross, which is stupid to the world. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. God promises that the wisdom of the world he will destroy. <laughs> Told you he doesn't like the wise men, the experts. We live in Silicon Valley. We like being smart people out here. Let me ask you to be wiser than the smart people out here and expect that God will take the expertise of Silicon Valley and wreck it. He promised it. I look for it all the time. It's happening. One of the reasons why our culture is blowing up is because the experts in our culture are blowing it. And God is helping them. He's wrecking it. Verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Let me say this in the 21st century. Where is the smart one? Where is the pundit? Where is the podcaster? Has not God made foolish your expertise and your wisdom in this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. You cannot know God through your wisdom. You cannot know God through worldly wisdom. You cannot know God through worldly education. It's revealed by God in the Bible. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Everything in our church is about this. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, to the religious and the secular, to the people who grew up in the church and the unchurched, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So let me close by saying this. So much of our sins are kind of invisible because they're covered up with our pride. They're covered up with our wisdom. God is in some kind of corner over there. His Bible's over there, kind of over there. It's like a church thing over there. And I'm just going to run my money over here. Oh, I'm just going to take care. Oh, you know, we got to get all our kids to do all these XYZ things and they're going to go to great college and they'll have a great life. Disconnected from the word of the cross. <laughs> but if you will take all your wisdom and all your pride and all your knowledge and lay them at the feet of the cross and lay the word of the cross, sift it, you will experience the refreshment of your bones and the healing of your soul. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that this is not an easy word to hear, especially in our city. I love that so many in our church and in our city, well, they like education and they like learning and they like reading and taking in media and information. But I pray that we would do it with the word of the cross. 
it seems stupid. It seems foolish. Sometimes we can't see how the gospel relates to teaching your son to drive. Sometimes we just can't see those things. But help us to see that you must be exalted in our hearts. And we must be suspicious of our wisdom and absolutely suspicious of our pride. Help us to not be wise in our own eyes, to fear you, to be in awe of you, to be in awe of the cross of Jesus, and to throw away this self-sufficiency, this self-lordship built upon our wisdom, not your foolishness. May we live our life built on all of your foolishness, the foolishness of the cross, most of all, and every strange teaching of your word which we've overlooked and never realized how powerful and wonderful it could be. Give us conviction over these next few weeks and help us to turn our priorities so that we may grow in trusting you with all our heart. In Jesus' name.